Welcome to Web3 with A6 and Z, a show about building the next generation of the internet from the team at A6 and Z Crypto. This show is for anyone, whether developer, artist, community leader, startup entrepreneur, other builder, policymakers, anyone seeking to understand and go deeper on all things crypto and Web3 towards a decentralized, community-owned, and creator-owned internet. This week's episode is a quick overview of principles for thinking about policy, briefly covering topics and recent moves that are top of mind in U.S. crypto regulation. It is based on a live conversation that took place a couple of weeks ago on Twitter with Congressman Jake Auchincloss of Massachusetts, also vice chair of the Financial Services Committee. He also formerly led product development at both a Fortune 100 insurance company and a cybersecurity startup. We also have Miles Jennings, general counsel and head of decentralization at A6NZ Crypto, who has advanced and published several legal frameworks for both builders and industry on topics such as DAOs and more. You can find those on our website. And finally, the conversation is moderated by A6NZ Crypto founding general partner, Chris Dixon. He's the first voice you'll hear, followed by the congressman and then Miles. As a reminder, none of the following is investment, business, tax, or legal advice. Please see a6nz.com slash disclosures for more important information, including a link to a list of our investments. So I'll just do briefly a little overview. I think uh, I, won't, I won't belabor too much since we've got, uh, we're sort of short on time, but, but you know, our view at A16Z is that Web3 is a major new uh, kind of computing movement that has the potential to unlock a whole new wave of innovation and specifically blockchains as enabling um, tokens and which allow for sort of new kinds of ownership, allow for new kinds of networks to be created that are owned and operated by communities instead of by companies. There are lots of different use cases. Um, some of them are digital, some of them are offline. One digital use case I'm particularly excited about is uh, allowing creative people. So for example, musicians, writers, you know, podcasters, et cetera, who today um, have not really benefited very much from the internet because large intermediaries like Google and Facebook stand in the way and take most of the money. When one thing we're really excited about is a new way to kind of unlock new business models for those, for those folks. There's also, of course, new financial applications. Uh, people have heard about DeFi, um, stable coins, things like that. There's also new kinds of social networks and other kinds of uh, marketplaces and a whole new whole kind of range of different things. So we see it as a kind of a major new movement and have a lot of great entrepreneurs working on things. Um, we'd love to see this movement happen primarily in, in the United States. Most of the companies we invest in are, are based here, as we've seen in the past with previous eras of the internet. Um, this was, this was, I think, a really positive thing for the U.S. So you have these kind of large, successful uh, tech companies based here. So that's that's another kind of goal of ours. Today, we'll be talking about policy. I think kind of our general view is so far, there hasn't, hasn't been a lot of kind of policy, you know, kind of legislative action. Most of the uh, government involvement has been through kind of enforcement actions. I think we've seen kind of the outcome of this, which over this crash, we've seen a lot of kind of bad things happen that that we think could have been probably prevented. And it feels like now, you know, hopefully that will be a catalyst for what we hope will be, you know, smart government action policy that balances innovation and the ability to kind of create these new ways of startups, but also protections for consumers and investors and others. So maybe with that, I mean, we have a bunch of specific things we could talk about, including um, some bills before Congress and some other things, but maybe with that, I'll, I'll pass it over uh, to the congressman. Chris, thanks again. I've been looking forward to having this conversation. Brief intro for our listeners. I represent the Massachusetts 4th in Congress, the suburbs of Boston. I'm a freshman representative, uh, and I am the vice chair of the Financial Services Committee in the House. So I've been uh, elbow deep in, in this policy really since day one a couple of years ago. And before we dig into the bills, I want to start with what I think of as three guiding principles for policy in this space at the federal level. And it's important to have these principles because right now it's pre-partisan. It's not even necessarily bipartisan. It's actually, this has not yet become a deeply politicized issue, which when you find one of those in Washington, D.C., uh, <laughs> it is a special thing and it is something to be cultivated and preserved because it, it gives you an opportunity to do real policy work. Uh, and these three principles, number one, should be that 
whatever we're doing, it should strengthen the role of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. Since World War II, the U.S. dollar alongside the U.S. Navy has really been one of the key pillars of U.S. global strength. And to the degree that stable coins or other financial innovation could persist and expand the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency, that is a major geostrategic, geoeconomic interest that Congress should be, should be sustaining. Number two, we want the innovation to happen here. We want it to happen in America. Right now, too much of it is, is getting pushed offshore by regulation by enforcement. That is paradoxically, I think, targeting named actors who are trying to operate in good faith as opposed to those on the periphery who are actually engaged in illicit activity. I represent Massachusetts, as I said. I think a good an analogy for this is, is biotechnology. People forget this because Massachusetts has become the biotech capital of the world. But in the 1980s and 1990s, biotech innovation happened really in Europe, actually. And it was a series of policy and regulation decisions that the United States made that allowed us to domesticate a lot of biotech innovation. The benefits of that have been profound, not just for my home state, but for patients and providers everywhere. And we want to see that same type of organic innovation here in the United States. We want crypto, the best and the brightest, to happen in America. And then number three, the third principle for me beyond the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency and domesticating innovation is I'm not a bull or a bear on crypto. I do not think that's Washington's job to figure out the use cases, to root for a certain application. That's entrepreneur's job. That's the market's job. We're not bulls or bears. We're zebras. We're referees ensuring fair play, consumer protection, market integrity, and contract enforcement. And I really think it's critical that we don't succumb in Washington to a predilection that politicians too often have to manifest their own vision of what some industry should be. Let's let entrepreneurs and consumers decide and just make sure everyone's playing by a set of stable, fair rules to do that. So I want Congressman, do you think if you had to sort of assess the current landscape, there's the Loomis Gillibrand bill, there's, there's some other activities going on. Like, how do you, how do you think about sort of the next year or two in Washington? So broadly speaking, the GOP is pretty sympathetic to crypto. Yeah, I'm speaking in broad strokes here. You'll always find exceptions. But GOP kind of is on board and sees the benefits. I think the center left is figuring this out. We're still looking at it, poking, prodding, asking questions. And then unfortunately, and I think without a whole lot of justification, the progressive left has become quite hostile. And that's going to be a dynamic that, that industry and, and policymakers are going to need to work on and, and to address. You mentioned the Gillibrand Loomis bill. It's probably the most significant federal effort yet done on crypto. For people's context, Senator Gillibrand is a Democratic senator from New York. Uh, senator Loomis is from Wyoming. These are two states that have significant crypto stakes. Uh, they're obviously uh, uh, of separate parties. Senator Loomis is a Republican. And this is a fairly comprehensive bipartisan effort to create digital asset regulation. Uh, and I'm happy to dive into some of the, the parameters of that bill and what I think its prospects are, if that's helpful. Yeah, I think that would be, that would be great to hear, Congressman. In particular, uh, one thing that I'm interested in is the comprehensiveness of a um, proposal that addresses many different facets of the industry. And, and it'd be interesting to hear your take on, on whether or not you think that is a viable strategy in terms of, of, of kind of getting everything passed at once, or if you think that there are you know, certain areas, um, you know, such as stablecoin legislation that we might, um, you know, sh or should be pr prioritizing? It's the age old question, you know, narrow and deep or wide and comprehensive, you know, do one big piece of legislation that everyone tries to get their luggage on that train that's leaving the station or do it incrementally. To be blunt, I don't know the answer to it. And I actually initially thought that the way to do this was narrow and deep through stablecoin legislation that really just tackled the issue of stablecoin issuance and the auditing and disclosure thereof. This bill is obviously a totally different approach. And I think the wise thing to do when you don't really know is to, is to push on both and figure out which one gets traction. And that's going to be my approach. I'm going to support both those efforts, narrow and as well as wide, and see which one gets traction because both of them would be beneficial in their own ways. This Gillibrand-Loomis bill 
there's really kind of six features of it and, and different people can break it down different ways, but I'll try to give a high level of the six different features here. One is clarity on the terminology. There are so many terms that get thrown around and we're seeing this with SEC enforcement in the courts now and elsewhere that don't really have strong grounded definitions. And this bill defines them. Everything from digital assets to distributed ledger technology, et cetera. This bill really just puts legal clarity around terms. And that's just going to save everybody money. (laughs) So you don't have to figure out what these things mean in court. The second thing it does is it demarcates between the CFTC and the FCC on who has jurisdiction over what. Broadly speaking, it's giving more authority to the CFTC. It's basically presuming that most digital assets are commodities unless proved otherwise. And as commodities, they would be subject to the CFTC and the spot market would create would be created under the CFTC. If it was put to the Howey test and, and was classified as a security, then the SEC would still have jurisdiction. So both agencies will be there, but the CFTC clearly has gained jurisdictional heft uh, through this bill. And they're also been tasked, these two agencies, to form a working group to help devise a, a self-regulatory organization, um, sort of similar to FINRA, that the industry could use uh, to help them interface with regulators. The third thing this bill does is it lays out rules for stable coins. And in general, I would say this is a, an approach that uh, tries to strike a medium between those who think that only banks should be able to issue stable coins and those who think that really anybody should be able to issue stable coins. This bill says banks can issue stable coins and non-banks can issue stable coins. Non-banks, though, have to work through a federal regulator to do that. And they're subject to pretty strict asset and liquidity requirements, as well as a disclosure regime. And they outlaw algorithmic stable coins. And we can we can dig in more because I'd be interested for your guys' thoughts on on the stable coin legislation. Fourth, the bill cleans up some taxes issues. It basically says if you're using crypto as a medium of exchange and you're exposed to to de minimis appreciation, you don't have to pay taxes on it. it. It it cleans up a real kind of stumbling block for this that is not the intent of the tax code. It directs a lot of studies on energy use, on the use of crypto in retirement accounts. As I said, on self-regulatory organizations, these studies are really meant to help the federal government just learn more as the industry evolves about uh, whether further regulation or regulatory revisions are needed. And then finally, it provides more clarity and disclosure for states and consumers, for state governments about how they're allowed to regulate crypto, and for consumers about what they should expect when they're engaging with crypto issuers or stablecoin issuers, kind of rules of the road for both. You know, one of the other areas that we've been particularly focused on is the initial step towards kind of establishing some legal frameworks for DAOs uh, in the context of Uh, federal tax laws. One of the things that we've worked a lot on is is trying to establish a, a legal framework in the United States that would be workable for DAOs. I think there's two real reasons why you see a lot of Web3 companies um, moving outside the U.S. One is um, lack of regulatory clarity here, but then also um, a lack of, of real legal entity structures for DAOs to exist in the United States, you know, means that there ends up being a lot of offshoring because ultimately, I think a lot of founders and, and you know, people in the space are looking for certainty. And then at the moment, that's just not available in the U.S. That's a terrific point. And I should have mentioned that about the DAOs. One of the more exciting to me, innovations at a blockchain and as you said, this provides, uh, this replaces some of the quicksand with, with much firmer footing. Yeah, that's right. So on the, on the stablecoin point, what's your general perspective on, on kind of how they, they crafted that? You know, we also have, have seen that you know, uh, Senator Timmy has put out uh, you know, legislation previously around stablecoins. And I think it speaks to uh, you know, your first principle that you outlined, which is, is that strengthening the role of the U.S. dollar uh, as the world's reserve currency, you know, obviously stablecoins can, can significantly help that. We've been very surprised just how large an appetite uh, the world seems to have for U.S. dollar denominated stablecoins. So it seems like a really positive area of direction that the that, that Congress could go in providing rules of the road. A hundred percent agree with you. The demand to store wealth in the U.S. dollar, if anything, has grown only stronger. I think the, the myth of the decline of the dollar has been punctured to some extent by the demand for stablecoins. I actually think we need to push harder for more expansive affordances for stablecoin experimentation. I don't agree that we should outlaw algorithmic stablecoins or stablecoins that have uh, non-traditional or you know, not 100% treasury 
backing, for example. Now, maybe they shouldn't be called stable coins. Maybe we need to provide a hierarchy of stability that is, is more digestible and legible to consumers and to investors. But I've got a lot of confidence that if you are requiring disclosure and if you have an insurance regime where people have to get uh, in, insured and rated, markets work and markets are going to price the liquidity of these stable coins, provided that there is, is transparency, disclosure and insurance. And we want to see that, that experimentation and innovation. It's so early. I just don't think we should be closing doors on, on new ideas. Yeah, I think we agree on that. Obviously, there are business models with respect to stable coins that you know are potentially too risky to allow for. But if you look at the performance of Maker, Dow, and and uh, Dai uh, over the the course of the you know last several years, uh, particularly in the last few months, right, we've seen the resiliency of that system and the protocol has handled uh, liquidations, you know, relating to the drop and and decline in asset prices that has all worked as intended. And Baker happens to be you know, more than one-to-one collateralized. So you know, it does have that advantage. But, but certainly there, there should be a pathway to those types of stable coins existing. Right? One thing that's yeah. missing from the bill is mm-hmm. any type of regulation around NFTs. Yeah. And if we think stable coins are complicated, NFTs are in, in almost a polar opposite way, equally as complicated. Chris, I'm interested for your thoughts on the potential of NFTs and what type of regulatory architecture might help them thrive and might help the creative economy do better with them. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, we're very excited about NFTs. It spans different areas. So I think we probably made something on the order of 15 investments in the last six months in in games. Um, These are sort of top game developers coming out of companies like Epic and Blizzard and, and Riot and sort of top game companies who are excited by the idea that you can have economies and games where you think about popular games like Fortnite today, you have an economy and you have virtual goods, but all the money goes back to the company that created the game. And in Web3 gaming, you have the potential to have economies where it's much more peer-to-peer. Um, and so users can create new kinds of digital goods or experiences and participate in that economy. And we think kind of really broaden the economic beneficiaries of these games. That's just one example. I think Another area, we have a few investments that I think is really exciting areas around music. So music, I think it's particularly interesting because everyone on the call is probably a fan of, of, of musicians and very passionate about it. And most musicians, unfortunately, today are, are um, relegated to, to making most of their money offline where they're you know, selling merchandise and things because there's no intermediary there. And online, they're very intermediated by Facebook, Google, Spotify, et cetera, and make very little money. One of the neat things with NFTs is they now have a way to go direct to their audience and sell digital collectibles and experiences and backstage passes and all sorts of other things. Um, and that can apply to all sorts of other creative classes that have that have mostly, you know, been left out of the, you know, the web, the web two companies, the Google, Facebooks, just they basically have, you know, very advanced machine learning algorithms for extracting all the money out of the system, including the money, you know, that was really generated by kind of the creative people that create all the content on the systems. So I think we think there's just a ton of potential there. We're making a lot of investments there. On the flip side, there are, as with anything, like like in this last price run up last year, we saw abuses of NFTs. You started having, you know, kind of behavior that where people kind of used NFTs to do things that look more like ICOs or something from the previous era. And, you know, there's all sorts of kind of questions around if there's, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but, you know, they see, some of them seem to get into kind of securities areas where they made promises and other kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And so I think this is another area where, to my knowledge, you tell me you'd know better. I, I don't think the, the Loomis Gillibrand bill addresses it, but I think no. it's another area where clarity would be helpful. I don't know if that clarity comes through specifically through NFT policy or from, from other, you know, from, from just from better guidance around other things, but it is, I think, an important area and one which we believe will benefit from, from policy that balances innovation and protect consumer protections. This is an area where I think it's so important for the industry to show and not tell. I, I mentioned before there was some skepticism, even even hostility maybe in, in the progressive wing of the Democratic Party to crypto. It's it's mostly leveled, though, at crypto manifesting in, in, in the form of financial services, better, faster, cheaper financial services. Now, I don't really understand that because if you're hostile to the big banks and to big tech, you should be rooting for a disruptive force, which Web3 clearly could be. But that is not sort of how the narrative has spun out over the last year. Whereas the creator economy, musicians, artists, craftsmen, 
These are folks who really are not able to capture the value that they're creating in, in this platform-driven economy. And demonstration projects about how musicians in particular could earn a middle-class wage from 1,000 to 2,000 true fans as opposed to you know, having to get 20 million streams on Spotify to get the equivalent of a middle-class wage. That would be incredibly powerful. And we don't have, as you said, there's, there's no NFT regulation within Gillibrand Loomis. You know, to the extent that there are securities hidden in an NFT, that's just going to come under the SEC. I, I think that's not so much new regulation. It's just that's going to get regulated in the existing body. But if there's true, true differentiation there, if there's true IP that's really distinct, we may need to look at, at individualized policy. Yeah, and one of the real challenges that you have within within the NFT space is that under how test you look at an NFT that let's just say is a piece of art, right? And and you would say, well, the implicit value of that that artwork is is the actual NFT. It is is the actual artwork, so it shouldn't be treated like a security. Mm-hmm. But one of the odd things that that comes about as a result of that is is that you know with NFTs you can do a lot more with them than you can do with you know a piece of physical art. So for instance, you can take an NFT of a of a character and turn them into a video game character. But then the question becomes: Well, if the person's expecting that, and you do implement you know and, and you're the creator and you're you know adding this additional value to the NFTs after the fact, does that make it more likely to become a secure? And so as a result of that, right, the, the way that the regulations kind of currently uh, apply is that creators are almost incentivized not to deliver value to the people that buy their artwork. And that's obviously an incentive structure that we don't, you know, that doesn't really make a lot of sense and ultimately doesn't kind of deliver value to, to consumers. And so I think that it's definitely something that needs to be worked on and a framework needs to be uh, implemented that kind of, you know, aligns incentives. Uh, and and kind of takes advantage of all the opportunities that the technology affords. That's an interesting point. Just to make sure I dig into that and understand, you're saying that you know if you look at Gillibrand Loomis, they basically say, hey, digital assets are under the CFTC, but they'll go to the SEC. They'll be considered a security if, out of many things, one of them is there is profit or revenue derived solely from the entrepreneurial or managerial efforts of others. That's right. And so you're saying that if if you kind of imbue an NFT through your entrepreneurial or managerial effort with more value, you may have just created a security. That's, yeah, that's exactly right. So, so you sell an original piece of artwork that, that a person holds and, and you could, you know, go about your day and then that's it, that the relationship is over. But isn't it better for consumers if, you know, the people continue to deliver value and utility potentially right. to their NFT holders? Currently, the way that our legal frameworks work is that that creates risk for the creators. And so they're actually incentivized not to do that, which just doesn't really make, make sense, right? Now, obviously, um, you know, you don't want to, to venture into lands where these things should be treated like securities, but we, we need a framework that actually uh, incentivizes people to, you know, protect consumers and deliver value rather than, than the opposite. There's a lot more that we could possibly cover, but um, I think that's a good directive. You know, I think it is incumbent on industry to to, uh, you know, and us and, and all the kind of community to demonstrate these use cases. I think that's begun and I think it's sort of underreported on, but I think it's something that we're going to certainly continue to push on. I guess, Congressman, my closing question to you would be, what else can we, on the industry side, what else can we be doing to kind of advance, advance this mission and, and to better work with policymakers? I think one is the show don't tell in terms of the the NFTs and empowering the creative economy. I think that's going to be really powerful. And demonstration projects starting small is fine. I mean, obviously, not all the kinks have to be worked out, but really bringing that into the real world. And as you said, it's been underreported and it's happening, which is exciting to me. The other, I think, is taking the initiative on the financial services side of the house. I mean, I broadly think of this as breaking down into creator economy and financial services at this point from the use cases we're seeing. On the financial services side of the house, taking the initiative on SROs, on self-regulatory organizations, we already see in the Gillibrand Loomis bill that they're directing the CFTC and the SEC to study what an SRO should look like and how they might want to work with an SRO. We've seen in with FINRA that an SRO can be beneficial. Uh, we've seen with you know the Motion Picture Association of America that an SRO can be beneficial. It, it can become an important buffer and interlocutor for industry with regulators. They can take some of the sharp edges off. I would get started on that now. 
I mean, you've got the trade groups with Blockchain Association and Coin and others, but I would start to set up with respected actors in the cryptocurrency ecosystem in particular, your own apparatus to police bad actors, to promote best practices, because actually in the medium term, I think it's really going to be to the benefit of domesticating innovation. Great. That's very helpful. Well, thank you, well, thank you very much, Congressman, for your time and, uh, and for all the work you did. And maybe we can uh, do this again sometime. I'd like that. Have a good week, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Peace. Thank you for listening to Web3 with A6 and Z. You can find show notes with links to resources, books, or papers discussed, transcripts, and more at a 6 zcryptocom This episode was technically edited by our audio editor, Seven Morris. To follow more of our work and get updates, resources from us, and resources from others, be sure to subscribe to our Web3 weekly newsletter. You can find it on our website at a 6 zcryptocom Thank you for listening and for subscribing. Thank you.